Good morning to each one. So good to see you and to be with you to worship God together in spirit and truth. I invite you to take your Bibles out. Be open to the book of Galatians chapter 5. We're continuing a series on Sunday mornings on the fruit of the Spirit. Fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Just those two verses we read of these nine characteristics are to be in the life of every Christian, every child of God that has the fruit of the Spirit. In great contrast to what just preceded it in the text, and that's the works of the flesh, that will keep one out of heaven. The fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5, 22 and 23. The King James Version reads, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. The majority of translations of the Bible versions Instead of gentleness there, as the King James Version has, has the word kindness. And so thus far we have studied the fruit of the Spirit, love and joy and peace and patience or long-suffering. And now this morning I want to focus our attention on this fruit of the Spirit, kindness. Think about how important is kindness. There was an interesting study done that in a study of 37 cultures around the world, 16,000 subjects were asked about their most desired trait in a mate. And for both sexes, the first choice was kindness. Acclaimed psychologists John and Julie Gottman gathered data on successful marriages for decades and found that kindness is essential to lasting union. Well, that seems to be confirmed many times in the Bible, how important that is in a marriage, how important that is just in our day-to-day -day lives. But what is kindness as we think of its definition from Vine's expository dictionary of Old and New Testament words? It is defined as serviceable, good, pleasant, gracious, also from Vine's Kindness is defined as goodness of heart, gentleness. And from the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia, defines it in addition to what we've already said, usefulness and beneficence. Now, you think about kindness being defined as useful or usefulness, this means that kindness involves action then, if, if it's useful. And truly, kind people will actively look for opportunities to show kindness. And beneficence means the quality or state of doing or producing good, active goodness or kindness. And from the Tyndale Bible Dictionary, Kindness is defined as the state of being that includes the attributes of loving affection, sympathy, friendliness, patience, pleasant, pleasantness, gentleness, and goodness. Kindness is a quality shown in the way a person speaks and acts is more volitional than emotional. Young people, you know that word volitional, what that means? means it's a choice of the will that you decide, you make up your mind, I'm going to be kind to others. And so it is more volitional, more of a choice of ours, a decision, than emotional. So kindness is not an emotion of feel or feeling, but it's a choice. And that brings us to the kindness of God. Turn with me in your New Testaments, please, to Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3, please. In Titus 3, verses 4 through 7. But when the kindness and the love of God, our Savior, toward man appeared not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, 
whom He poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that having been justified by His grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. And so the Apostle Paul here speaks of how God was kind to one and all by providing salvation to us and others through His Son. I want you to think back as we read of God's kindness here in Titus chapter 3 and verse 4. But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared. Think about the definition of kindness. One of the definitions was usefulness or beneficence. And remember that meant active goodwill. You take action. And kindness, how it's the state of being that includes the attributes of loving affection. And so, as we said, it's more volitional than emotional. And we see that with God. We see that how He took action. It wasn't just He felt a certain way, but how was His kindness towards us expressed? And in the most profound way, imaginable in providing His only begotten Son to save us, to redeem us. And so it's not by works of righteousness which we have done. That's not what brought about our salvation. But it was because of His kindness, His love, verse 5, His mercy, He saved us. Through the washing of regeneration, renewing of the Holy Spirit, as we think of baptism here, the washing of regeneration, the new birth, and whom he poured out, it says, the Holy Spirit, abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, justified by God's grace, that we can be heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Just before this in the text in Titus 2, verses 11 and 12, we read of how the grace of God that brings salvation appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. Keep reading verse 13 and 14 looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ who gave Himself for us that He might redeem us from every lawless deed, purify for Himself His own special people, zealous for good works. Oftentimes we don't read, we read of you know the mercy of God, the love of God, the grace of God, but here Paul gives emphasis to His kindness, the kindness of God. You know, Jesus said something about that and his heavenly father there in Luke chapter 6 in his sermon on the mount in Luke's account, Luke chapter 6. And notice what he says there in Luke's gospel with me please. Luke 6 in verse 35 Jesus says, but love your enemies do good and lend, hoping for nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, for He is kind to the unthankful and evil. Therefore, be merciful, just as your Father also is merciful. He is kind, it says, to the unthankful and to the evil. There's that volition again. God deciding, I'm going to be kind, not because these people deserve it. And we can go back to the first point here. Not because we deserved it, not by works of righteousness, which we have done. And I've, I've earned this right for God to, to save me. I've earned this, this blessing that He's going to, no, none of us have. No, it's by His grace, it's by His mercy, it's by His kindness, it's by His love that He decided to do that. And in like manner, here are people that certainly are undeserving. They're not thankful toward God. It kind of reminds me of Romans 1, the description there of the world. That they're not thankful to their Creator and all that He's done. They're evil. They're living in rebellion to God's will, and yet He's what? He's kind to those individuals of His creation. And of course, Jesus in the sermon here is saying that those who are citizens of the kingdom are to also be like the Heavenly Father and love our enemies, 
Do good to those who don't do us good. It's easy to be kind to those who are kind to us. But God calls us, the Lord calls us to this much higher standard and reminds us of His kindness to the unthankful and to the evil. And the next statement is, Therefore, for this reason, because this is so, be merciful just as your Father is merciful. Yes, He's merciful to those who don't deserve His mercy, and that includes us. We think of others, that includes us. Paul even speaks that in the ages to come, Ephesians 2, 7, how God's going to show us the exceeding riches of His grace and His kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So Ephesians chapter 2. You're familiar with these verses in this text, I know, but Ephesians 2, beginning in verse 4, it says, But God, who is rich in mercy, because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up together, and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come, so not now, but later, in the ages to come, He might show the exceeding riches of His grace, in His kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So His kindness wasn't a one-time thing. His kindness was demonstrably shown in the giving of His Son and salvation through Him, but it continues to be shown in our day-to-day -day lives, and it will be shown to us and expressed to us in the future in heaven. The kindness of God. But then we think about the kindness of Jesus Christ. You know, Jesus practiced kindness that was considered really radical for that time and that culture. You know, his kindness, when you, you stop and think about it and you go through the gospel accounts, often extended to people that were not treated very well by others. Think about how his disciples and others at that time were very dismissive of children. Not Jesus. Jesus always made time for the children and for the infants that were brought to him. And he would take them up in his arms and he would bless them as the parents brought them to him. And he would also speak to grown-ups and said, you must become like little children if you're going to enter the kingdom of heaven. Those that the grown-ups wanted to brush aside, he brought into him and says, you need to be like them. You need that humility. Otherwise, you're not entering my kingdom. He was kind to the sinners and the tax collectors, and of course we know he received great backlash because of that. You have the religious elites, you had the Pharisees and the scribes and the chief priests, and they would have nothing to do with this class of people. And so the sinners, who would that be? Because we've all sinned, but sinners, those who are not living or trying to live, evidently, according to the law of Moses among the Jewish people. And then the tax collectors are grouped in with the sinners because they're working for the foreign government, Rome, and they're taking our taxes, and many of them were dishonest and would take more than they're supposed to and pocket it for them, their own profit. And so they were grouped together, and Jesus would spend time with these people that others would not give any attention to whatsoever because they didn't want to become unclean. But Jesus would even eat with these individuals. And of course, he spent time with them in order to teach them, but he did it because of his kindness. Remember, kindness takes action. It's not just a feeling. It's expressed in action. And Jesus did that with the sinners and the tax collectors. He was kind to Samaritans, kind of similar to our previous point. Because the Samaritans were a mixed breed of people, Gentiles and Jews who had married, the Jews would have, remember John chapter 4? <laughs> John chapter 4, John tells us, for Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. But Jesus did. Jesus did in John chapter 4 with the Samaritan woman. And Jesus did with the whole town there where the majority of them came to believe that he was the Messiah, the Christ. And so the hero of Jesus' story in Luke 10, when the lawyer tried to justify himself, who is my neighbor? He tells the parable of the Good Samaritan. 
He was kind to those who were despised and hated, such as the tax collectors and sinners, the Samaritans, and even the Gentiles, those uncircumcised, heathen, pagan Gentiles, because he came to be Savior unto all men. He was kind to one and all. In fact, you remember the centurion there in Matthew chapter 7? I say Matthew 7, it's not Matthew 7, because that's the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, Matthew chapter 8, next chapter. Um, and then we also find in Luke's account as well. But Jesus said of this centurion that had a servant that was sick, very sick. And, and he did not, when Jesus drew near to the house, he told Jesus not to come in. I'm not worthy for you to come under my roof. And I'm also one of authority. I tell my servant to come here and he comes and tell him to go and he goes. He recognizes Jesus' authority, his power. And he says, just say the word and my servant will be healed. Jesus, it says, he marveled at his faith. He says, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. But he said that about a Gentile. But he was kind to the Gentiles. He was kind to the multitudes who would come and flock to him to hear his teachings, to be healed by him. And when they tarried with him the whole day, he, he had compassion on them and miraculously fed them. We had the 5,000 plus, later the 4,000 plus. So there was at least two occasions when he fed thousands of people because of his kindness. He was kind to lepers. Of course, he was kind to all that had sickness and disease and countless, we don't know how many, over his three-year ministry that he healed and, and then also cast out evil demons or spirits. But I, I emphasize leprosy because they're unclean and it was a dreaded disease and it also could spread. And yet we read in the gospel accounts on one occasion where he saw a leper and he had compassion and he said, Lord, if you're willing cleanse me of my leprosy. And he says, I'm willing. And he touched him. He physically touched him. You know, lepers were supposed to cry out, unclean, unclean. They were separated from the rest of society. When's the last time anybody had physical contact with that person? Well, prior to them having leprosy, whenever that was. But you think about that kindness, you think about that compassion and the human touch. Jesus says, I'm willing. And he's cleansed. And yes, he was kind to his enemies. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He came to save his enemies as well. And there were about 3,000 of them on Pentecost that previously were his enemies that participated in his crucifixion. But he came to save them. And they were, they were cut to the heart by the truth that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, their Savior. You think about the kindness of God, the kindness of Jesus Christ. And of course, the kindness that is to be found in the life of Christians. Kindness, as we read in our scripture reading this morning, is a characteristic of true love. Paul begins there in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 describing agape love. And he says, love is patient. And then he says, love is kind. And again, the thing about agape love is it's very similar to how we define kindness is that it's act of goodwill. Even if the other person doesn't deserve it or not, that doesn't matter and it's supposed to be shown toward one and all. But these are the defining characteristics of love, real love, genuine love that God defines for us, the Holy Spirit defines for us here in 1 Corinthians 13. And one of the defining characteristics or qualities of true love is kindness. Love is kind. It's something that 
Paul would say to the saints in Colossae that Christians are to put on in his or her life. After our obedience to the gospel, we realize that much of the world is unkind. And I think that is illustrated so much more now that there's social media, that those uh, avenues are used with Facebook and Twitter in particular, and that, that forum and others where dirt and evil are being slung around at others from their computer or their phone as they type it out, text it out. And yet, even if we were unkind previously before becoming a Christian, as a child of God, it must be our determination to put off unkindness and put on kindness here in verse 12. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, Put on kindness. It is a, after all, fruit of the Spirit as we're focused on Galatians 5, 22 and 23. And in Ephesians chapter 4, if you'll back up a couple of books or a few pages in your New Testaments to Ephesians chapter 4, every Christian is told to be kind to one another, right? And be kind to one another, tender hearted. Forgiving one another, even as God and Christ forgave you. And I say those three instructions in that one verse really connect to one another, right? To be kind to one another, to have a tender heart, to also then to be willing to forgive those who wrong me, wrong you in Christ, even as God and Christ forgave you. And so, are you... A kind person. We're not always kind, are we? We're not. Sometimes we're the opposite of being kind. We're unkind. We can be mean. Put it nicely, we can be grumpy. But you think back to the fruit of the Spirit being love, Enjoy and patience. You think about the ones we have studied thus far love and joy and peace and patience or long suffering and kindness. And I think back to the ones that have preceded it, and, and then if we have those, are we not going to be kind? If we have love toward others, aren't we going to be kind? If we have the fruit of the spirit of joy and happiness, isn't it going to be kind of natural then? A byproduct of our joy is that we're going to express kindness towards others and what, how, what we say, how we treat them, what we do. Well, sure. If we're more patient with people and circumstances, aren't we more inclined to be kind then? And when we're not patient and we're, we don't suffer long, we're going to be, tend to be unkind. Does that make sense? And that if we're striving to be at peace with all men, peace with God, peace with others, that ties into kindness too. And I'm not necessarily saying that's why Paul put it in that order. That's why the Holy Spirit put it in that order. But it makes sense to me to go back and connect the ones that have, have preceded it to say, okay, if I'm this and I'm this and I'm this, then it naturally flows. I'm, I'm going to be kind. And when I'm not acting kind, I need to go back and look at the others. Well, there's a lack of love there. <laughs> there's definitely a lack of patience there. Maybe I'm not having that joy that I should have in the Spirit. But again, it's a decision. It's not just an emotion. Well, I don't, I don't feel like being kind today. Well, I'm glad God's not that way. I'm, I'm glad our, our, our Savior is not that way. Well, I'm just, I don't feel like being kind to Jesse today. He's kind to the unthankful and the evil. What's our excuse? 
We need to be kind to one another. And when we're not, to seek God's forgiveness and that of others. Maybe it's our spouse. Maybe it's our children. Maybe it's our brother or sister in Christ. Maybe it's a stranger that we don't even know in the way we act and behaved and brought shame and reproach upon the name of Christ. And so we must humble ourselves and do that. I've had to do that. Perhaps you have too. But be kind to one another. It requires action. We can do that in so many ways. Maybe that's writing a note or sending a card to someone to encourage them. Using our time to go visit someone, see them, whether it's a physical reason, a spiritual reason, or maybe both. Take food to someone. That's an act of kindness. To speak words of encouragement. We gave a lesson about that not too long ago and how we all need to be a Barnabas. We all need to give encouragement. We all at times need to receive encouragement. But here's another way to be kind to one another. Speak words of encouragement. Practice good manners towards others. Practice gratitude. Practice gratitude, thankfulness in our hearts. To listen more. There's a, a quality of a, having good manners. To actually listen to someone. That's being kind. It's not kind to, to not listen to someone. Be considerate. Be slow to speak. Please and thank you. No thank you. Yes ma'am. Yes sir. Signs of respect. Signs of kindness. Of course a smile. And a warm greeting. A handshake. Or if preferred, a hug of brotherly affection. As I stuck out my hand to Erica this morning, and she went like this for a hug. And I sarcastically said, oh, I didn't know you were into hugging. Of course, of course, I've known that about Erica. Some people are, and some people are not. That's fine. But still, we can be kind, whether it's a hug or not a hug, right? With a smile and with a warm greeting. Because of our brotherly affection for one another, seeing our brethren being together, to study, to worship together, to express to others our appreciation in our love, to practice patience with others. We touched on this earlier, tying it back to the fruit of the Spirit we've already studied, but that's another way to be kind to one another. Practice patience with others. And those who are not easy to be patient with, it takes practice. So let me ask you, is this fruit of the Spirit being practiced actively in your life right now do you characteristically, regularly speak and act with kindness? Are you kind even to the unthankful and to the evil? As we set out this, in this new week, let's focus on this fruit of the Spirit. Let's focus on growing in this fruit of the Spirit. And think about these three questions going forward, and of course it's not just be for today and for the week, it's supposed to be in our life, but if we're focused on it, it's probably going to be more likely that it's going to hopefully continue to be in our minds and, and, and practiced in our lives. But think about that, the, re the rest of the day, how I speak to others, young people, siblings, spouses, brethren, friends, how we speak and act towards others, to do that with kindness, and even those out in the world. I mean, this is one of the ways that we're going to be a salt to the earth and a light to this darkness, that we're kind to those who don't deserve it, those who are unthankful, those who are evil, to the non-believers, the unbelievers. And again, let's be reminded of what Paul said here in Titus chapter 3. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, He saved us not because of righteous things we had done, but because of His mercy, He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that having been justified by His grace, we might become heirs having the hope of eternal life. Dear friend, would you respond 
this morning to the kindness and love of God, your Savior. I want you to think about what he did for you. That you did not deserve, that I didn't deserve, but because we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, we needed a Savior and he provided it for us by his Son, Jesus Christ. There's not a bunch of righteous things you can do to earn his salvation. It's by his grace we're saved through faith. But we are called upon to show our love for him by our obedience to him. We studied in the downstairs class, uh, class this morning in junior high, high school, the conversion of the Philippian jailer. The greatest question asked there, what must I do to be saved? This is what God has done. Never can make up for it, but always be grateful for it and praise and glorify him. But what he would have you to do is to believe in his son, that he is the Christ, the son of God, John 3, 16. He would have you to repent of your sins, Acts 2, 38, Acts 17, 30. And he would have you to confess your faith in him and his son, Jesus Christ, Romans 10, 9 and 10. And that you would be baptized into his son, your savior, for the remission of your sins. If you haven't done that yet, why not do that this morning? Why not be saved today? Why not be able to go on your way rejoicing because your sins have been washed away, your sins have been forgiven, you're no longer lost, you're saved, you're no longer on the path of destruction but the path that leads to everlasting life. We stand ready and happy to assist you in your obedience if you'll let that be known as we stand and as we sing.